Hello and welcome to Dinis Guarda, uh, Cities ABC Open Business Council YouTube podcast series. We are here once again to profile leading projects and personalities that are changing the world and creating better narratives for the challenge we face as society, the challenge we face as communities, as cities, as organizations. During this series, we've been profiling a lot of different personalities, and our focus is always looking at the people that actually are driving projects that think out of the box, that actually look at solutions that can help empower society, and as well, how to use the best technologies of our time to create a better narrative and not just the dysfunctionality and sometimes disruption that we've been facing. So today, I'm particularly excited to welcome to our series David Davis, that is the CEO of Ag Unity and a global agripreneur um, that has been working with the blockchain innovation for the agro industry. So I want to start by just highlighting some of the achievements of David because it's quite impressive. With over 30 years experience in innovation applications design, David has found and serves, served as CEO of many fintech and SaaS software as a service companies, and as well mobile companies with great success. David has more than a decade of experience, especially uh, previously in his, his kind of initial jobs, uh, working global investment banks. And of course, the names are quite big, from Goldman Sachs to Lehman Brothers, Nomura and Standard Chartered Bank. And uh, he's been experienced as a global ad responsible for over $100 million market data budget, which is quite impressive as well. Um, during this work and after leading, uh, leaving these organizations, he's been working in fintech, in blockchain, cryptography, and decentralized data sharing protocols technology. And uh, David is considered the leading voice on the use and deployment of blockchain technology internationally most specifically in the impact that looks as how can we actually bring blockchain technologies for trust, digital identity, and financial inclusion. And uh, his work with especially Ag Unity has been kind of cutting edge and as well creating a lot of international um, accolades and awards. As the founder of, uh, and CEO of Ag Unity that uh, mostly started in 2016, um, the project has been focused on being a tech for good, a venture applying blockchain and smartphone technology to improve the lives of small pharma cooperatives in developing countries. And AgUnity has been the recipient of dozen awards, including the Global Agripreneur of the Year in 2018. So as well, AgUnity Ag has been creating a token that is trading and we're going to be talking about that. But some of the things that uh, especially Ag Unity has been working is the idea of working and being recognized by the likes of IFC and the World Bank, MasterCard Foundation, UN Food and Agriculture Organization, and the Oxford University. So this is quite impressive. And I welcome David to our series. I've, there's a lot of things here that I'm particularly excited and I wanted to talk. So David, thank you so much for having the time and welcome to our series. Oh, thank you very much for having me. So David, I want to I wanna start by, um, I think in this case, there's a lot of areas that I'm quite excited because there's here financial inclusion, there's technology, there's fintech, there's blockchain and there's crypto and there's decentralized technology. So, but I want to start by you. So as the CEO and as well someone that started in the biggest financial organizations in the world and as well working both in finance and investment banking, but as well in data, um, I would like to see how do you went from that world that is quite privileged and very well paid to work in uh, serving and creating solutions, especially in the agriculture tech, which is a key thing, especially with the areas what is happening around the world. So a bit of your history before you go to Act, Act Unity and different things you guys are doing. Sure. Well, I actually, I've, I've really come full circle because I grew up on a wheat and sheep farm in, in remote outback South Australia. So... Yeah, our, our town had four houses and um, we were almost an hour's drive from the school and um, half an hour drive from any sort of a shop. So I come from that really remote region, but I, I'd also always um, driven to technology from a young age. I'm um, back in the in the days when I built my first computer from a kit uh, as a Dick Smith Super 80 and it, it took me all of a day to get most of it together and then a, another eight months to get it to actually work. 
Um, and then I learned to program in assembly language. So I spent quite a while in Australia and I moved to Hong Kong. Um, and then after Hong Kong, I traveled for a bit and, and then um, moved to London, eventually found myself in, in London and a friend that I'd met there worked at UNESCO and he told me how to submit a grant application to UNESCO. And I submitted a, a grant application for a really ambitious project. This is back in 90, 96, 97. Um, and the, the project was called Over Africa and we took a, a powered paraglider um, over the UNESCO World Heritage Sites in West Africa. Um, and that, is a very important part of, of how we ended up doing Ake Unity because I sort of grown up on a farm, worked in technology for a longer period of time, and then also spent this year in West Africa, which is one of the poorest areas of, of the world, um, seeing the challenges that really smallholder farmers face. So it was really from great firsthand experience that we were in a, a good position to do Ake Unity. Um, when that project ended, um, I felt didn't really know where to go in the world. So I just went to Japan um, and ended up firstly working for a company and then starting my own company in Japan that um, Japan had the first web browsing mobile phones for anyone that doesn't know. Um, Docomo started it, but there were three competing standards and we built a middleware product for that um, called Mint and that company eventually got acquired. Um, and that was before I ended up in investment banking. So after that company got acquired, Goldman Sachs were one of my clients and, and they hired me to build a system called Technology at My Desk. And that system won the, the Global Innovation Award at Goldman, which is a pretty big deal. And Goldman being Goldman, they wanted to move the project to New York. So they offered me a job in New York and I'm, I'm not a huge fan of New York and America in general. I'm not not for living anyway. I like visiting, but um, wonderful people, wonderful country. I didn't didn't fancy living in New York, so instead I moved ten floors down to Lehman Brothers, um, just five years prior to the GFC. So I was running Treasury Technology, um, which for anyone that's not familiar with banking, Treasury funds the bank. So we were moving the cash around the around the world every day to keep the bank um, still trading. Um, which was, so you, you don't get a whole lot closer to ground zero than that. Um, and then I, you know, then I got hired into Standard Chartered and, and I had a company as well at the same time that called Cost Optics that did cost allocation for big banks. And we were also working on another um, blockchain-like technology called Zenect, which was, um, we built a, a blockchain from the ground up over three years um, and it, it's more of a, um, a communication protocol. If you think of a hybrid between BitTorrent and blockchain, it was doing something like that. And it was intended to disrupt the way market data is moved into banks. So going after the back end of Bloomberg and Reuters and that company. So we were working on that uh, when we happened to go to a, a conference in London um, and into the hackathon and, and Ag Unity actually started at a hackathon where we were trying to come up with the biggest world changing idea we could um, in order to win a prize from Singularity University. And that idea was Ag Unity, which was the combination of this history of working with mobile technology, blockchain, having it grown up on a farm and knowing the big scale of things, but also having experienced very firsthand way um, what the challenges of remote area farmers are. So I want to go, before I go to Agunity, and I have a lot of questions. So how was the bridge between working with some of the biggest financial organizations? And I know that you had always this drive for change and as well having the experience with the farm in Australia, which is a beautiful story. And actually going from a remote to the top of the world is kind of impressive as well, because that implies a huge strong and will. But how was the, the experience, especially because, of course, uh, let's say you started in quite well, 2018 or 2016, of course, if you would touch in blockchain technology or crypto, especially coming from a big bank, you probably would be persona non grata. I remember that uh, when I started working with blockchain and I had discussions with people in the city, everyone was saying, don't mention that. And I had friends of mine that uh, were working with major banks 
and they could not even get close to the banks because they were working with crypto when they started working. And of course, now it's mainstream and even JP Morgan and Goldman Sachs are actually some of the biggest crypto holders in the world, uh, which is a paradox. But how was that, that transition? Because of course, in your case, you come from big banking um, and then you went to blockchain and crypto. But I would like to look at, first of all, of course, the transition between this, but as well on the technology side, because that's not an easy thing to do, especially if you have that hat uh, behind you. No, no, I think I think one of the very interesting things about big banking, and, and this was really obvious at a couple of the places I worked, is so many people just do their particular siloed job, and they don't always look at the big picture of what the bank's doing. You know, that's most obvious with Lehman Brothers. That I think ninety eight percent of the bank had no idea that a you know that the bank was in in such dire straits and and what was interconnected. Like most people would just coming to work and they're a product controller, so they do their job. Um, and Standard Chartered was very similar to that. There were people like, um, we saw loans going out to companies that were not viable in the wake of GFC and, and the people that are issuing the loans didn't really care as long as they could transfer the money. So there's a lot of very siloed behavior in banking and, and people don't often look at the big picture. And, and so I was a bit of a, um, bit unusual in a banking environment. So I probably shouldn't have lasted as long as I did in banking. Um, and I only did that because I had the gumption to take on projects that no one else would touch. And I guess I was fortunate enough that they succeeded. So I got away with it. But a lot of people, you know, for a lot of people taking risks in, in banks like that is, is a career moving end, a career ending move, sorry. Um, that if you do take on really challenging tasks, there's a lot of people looking to you know, find fault in what you're doing and take you down. Um, and I think I was probably just fortunate. Like I really not suited to that environment. Um, I just managed to, to survive in it long enough. That's amazing. And, and so from that, uh, that uh, part of this, so how did you discover first blockchain and crypto? I, I would like to go for that because of course you were already looking at data. So probably it was kind of normal. Um, but, uh, but of course, looking at this cryptography, there's the crypto, there was the, at the time, let's say, when we were still on that, it was when Bitcoin started. I'm sure you start looking, but I'd like to look at how do you start yeah, engaging? Because I think a lot of people talk about this before. Sorry, I want one note is that people talk about this, but normally it's always, okay, how can I make money on Bitcoin? And I think you and even me, I never actually was about the money. It was always about the innovation that came out of that. But I'm sure I would like to have your story. How did you engage both with the idea of blockchain and technology and as well with the token and the crypto and decentralized technology and decentralized tokens as well, which is different. Yeah, no, so I actually didn't start by looking at blockchain. Um, it started by looking at sharing data and I, um, I was reverse engineering the BitTorrent engines. Um, well, actually the, the eDonkey, which is a similar, similar protocol to that. Um, so after Lehman and Nomura, I was on a, I got an awesome redundancy. So I had time to do stuff. I was doing my dive master and this stuff. And it, in the, in the process, I was pulling apart um, the eDonkey and BitTorrent protocols and rewriting them in a different way. So they could be used for a different purpose, um, which ended up being this market data thing. And around about that time, I started to hear about, you know, this Bitcoin thing and, um, and it was really early days. So I, I downloaded the code from that and I sort of started reverse engineering that and started to look at how a hybrid can come about it. So I think the distinction is, and I think this is a really important, um, really important way of differentiating um, how people adapt to things. Some people look for an opportunity that'll make money. You know, most of the people in banking look for, how can I use this? How can I do that? Um, I think the much more important thing is what is the problem you're trying to solve and then what can be used for it. So I very much came to know a great deal about um, crypto cryptography and, and bit, uh, sorry, blockchain um, by trying to use it for a specific purpose. And I think that's always the best way to, to become knowledgeable on something is actually have a problem that you're trying to solve and and see how that can fit on you know if it doesn't work throw it away try something else and that was the process i was going through when we started ag unity which gave me a extremely good um grounding um for the work it would 
or what we had to achieve with AgUnity. Okay, that's amazing. And uh, and so then tell us how did you start AgUnity, uh, the team, the vision, and from the beginning to what it is now, if you can tell us a bit of the story. And for people that never heard about AgUnity, because it's really impressive what you guys are doing, but it's actually you need the more marketing. And I think when, I, when initially you guys came to us, I was kind of... Um, well, I didn't know about the project, but I think the project is much more interesting than, well, there's 2,000 tokens in the world. This is actually probably more interesting than 99.99. So I think it needs yeah, more. You know, we didn't... Yeah, <laughs> yeah we, we thought about a token right from the beginning, but we, we deliberately didn't go anywhere near it for well over five years now. So we started in April 2016 at a hackathon, as I mentioned. And it was a fintech for good hackathon in London. Singularity University had a prize. I've always been great fans of Ray Kurzweil and Peter Demandis from um, from their, you know, think big visions. Right? They, it's it's something I, I relate to a lot. Um, so we just tried to come up with the biggest world changing idea we could in order to win the prize. It wasn't. We weren't trying to start a company. We were just trying to come up with a a really good idea to win the prize and go to Sing Singularity University's. Um, camp um so my partner in that was john who was the lawyer from my um previous company um and so yeah we won the prize and immediately after we won that we were approached by costa perrick from um, gates foundation who ran financial services of poor for gates foundation and another lady from unicef and costa perrick was just really enamored by what we'd done. He said, look, we see this problem all over the world and you guys just nailed it. Um, and we really want you to take this seriously. So it was at that point that this hackathon idea, we've gone, you know, over the weekend, we'd realized that, hang on, we're onto something big because we were talking to a cooperative in India and another one in South Africa. And they were giving us really strong feedback that look, you know, just getting the farmers to have decent record keeping and a way of organizing better is really profound change to them. And it was when, you know, Gates Foundation came and said, look, we really think this is good. Um, but, you know, that's the point where you go, okay, we've, we've stumbled onto something that's a real big gap of opportunity. And then we circulated it around. So, you know, Gates Foundation said, look, if you need help, come to us. And five years later, we still haven't got a grant application through with Gates Foundation. Hopefully, we've, I think we've got five in the process at the moment. So we, we might eventually get one. But it was that inspiration. But when we when we spoke to Asia Development Bank and IFC World Bank and other large NGOs, we found that more so than banking, you know, other industries, like NGOs just are not good at doing innovation or technology. Uh, World Food Program's got a bit of an innovation center, but other than that, they just don't do it. So they were probably 10 years behind in what they could deploy. And they just loved this idea of giving farmers a phone that could be relevant and useful for them. Um, so we knew we were onto something that resonated with a lot of people that were in the field and were seeing these problems. And so the first thing you do in that situation is you send your lawyer out to live in the jungle. So John went out and lived in a house in Kenya with no floor and showering under a hose for a whole year. But what was really great about that is he spent so much time with the farmers and we were able to work through designs and come up with functionality that was really useful to them. Now, that to most like application designers, that doesn't sound really hard. What you've got to understand with developing world farmers, you could give them something that was completely useless and they would never tell you because they would assume they didn't understand something about it. And you know, you were the technology guys from overseas, so it should be right. And so it's very, very difficult to get feedback or any sort of design input from remote world farmers who most of whom I should I should back this up and say like Ag Unity really provides phones, uh, very purpose built phones, um, like this one here, um, for the very lowest income farmers in the world. Like a lot of our farmers are living on one or two dollars a day. Um, they've never had a phone before in their life. If they were, if they did, it was a feature phone. They've certainly never had a smartphone or a computer or access to any other technology. Most of them have never had televisions or electricity or anything like that. So we're dealing with a completely disconnected demographic that doesn't really know what would help them. So it's quite a long process to sort of build something, try it out, see what they do with it, and then 
you know, John had to have the farmers around his house for dinner every couple of nights and, and after they get drunk, they'll start to tell him what the story is. And I spent um, quite a lot of time in Myanmar and also Papua New Guinea myself, where we ran other projects at the, at the time. So it was the Kenya, Papua New Guinea, and Myanmar didn't go ahead, but we learnt a lot from the farmers. And we also learnt when you come into a country, don't deal with the government. Um, go directly in, find your group of farmers, do it all quietly, and then tell the government you've done it because they'll, you know, any, any early involvement with the government will just complex, make things complex. So that's where we started. Um, small team, you know, um, I brought in Keith Nielsen and Stefan Barrett. They both come from Lehman, they'd worked with me at Lehman Brothers. They were both senior vice presidents, um, you know, very highly paid, well-educated people. And once I told them what we were doing, they more or less dropped their super affluent jobs and, and came with me to change the world. Um, and we brought on then Petra and Angus who come from environmental and NGO backgrounds because they gave us a lot of experience in Navitra. So that's sort of the core team. I forgot to mention Neville. Um, so Neville's a strategist that worked with us many times. And that was the core team for a um, couple of years, the first couple of years. And we had a really hard time getting the application out, getting it deployed, getting people that believed we actually had a viable business behind this. Um, and we were very fortunate that a lovely lady called Ophelia Wong, um, was a Hong Kong billionaire, um, saw us at an event and invested a quarter of a million dollars. So we, we'd self-funded a lot. She invested in us and that's what got the company off. We relocated it to Australia and we've just been, you know, growing ever since. So we went from that humble beginnings and a, a year of taking no, you know, more than a year of taking no salaries and, and and working and spending lots of time in field and living in huts and things um, to now being just over 50 people in 18 countries um, spread all over the world doing projects all over and, and having you know I think the most important thing we've achieved in that time is we've shown the NGOs and commodity buyers and other organizations that we deal with that this is a really viable way to change the lives of people in developing markets and it can also be done in a commercially viable way. That's impressive. And, uh, and actually, it's well, first of all, kudos to what you guys have been doing because it's really impressive. And, and I think the way you did it as well, because a lot of tokens, uh, and even for me, I speak with my experience, I created the Humanique, which was very similar to what you guys are doing, but not for farmers, but for people uh, to create financial inclusion, actually with the phone as well. And actually we were quite successful initially, but then our words start fighting more and I decided to walk away on the project. But it's interesting to see the difficulty and uh, as well as interesting, I interview um, uh, uh, Costas Peric and I have a good relationship with him. So it's a very small world and he's actually one of the people doing more and around that area. So in terms of the work you did so far, because I'm particularly interested on that, uh, and as well, you, you told the story, but so what would be the achievements that you think AgUnity did so far in the last couple of years that you guys have been working? And I love the way you're doing that you are trying to really understand how things work, try to look at the solutions and then go and expand and come up, up to, to the government, because I think that's the way to go, because I did a lot of mistakes, even me advising governments on that level. But at the same time, one of the things for people listening to us, um, so the financial inclusion is a big thing. There's 1.5 billion people without financial inclusion access in the world. And from this 1.5 billion, of course, this is mostly in emerging markets, but then on the top of this, there's probably another 1 billion people that have that excluded from the financial market. It's different from financial inclusion because this happens in the US, it happens mm -hmm. in the UK, it happens in Europe. So there are people who don't know how to use financial systems, they don't know how to use very basic stuff. But of course, when it comes to agriculture, um, this is particularly powerful because for instance, I've been working with Ghana and actually I'll probably introduce you to them. There's, if you just go through, in India for instance, if you go through the rural communities and you just help setting up these systems, you can create massive difference and massive social impact. But this is not simple because like you said, uh, for instance, in India, I remember I was working with one of the biggest ONGs in the world and they wanted to send money to pay the salaries of people in India and they couldn't do it because the financial system was not working. Um, so I just would like to go through this kind of uh, 
history of the last few years, what would be like the first steps you did, what was the things that you're really excited. Mm. And I know that you won a lot of awards, so I have a couple of questions around the agriculture tech and as well the, the financial parts that you do and even the phone. But I would like to see mostly what, what has been the journey, because of course you are yeah. being, it's, it's ironic that Costa Peric, you work with them, but he never actually had, actually asked any help to them until now, which is kudos again. But I would like to hear a bit about that, that history, because it's very important for people li listening to us and especially people that are interested in these areas. Yeah, like we, it was, I think the most profound, the, the best way of summing it up is that we were continually like learning and pivoting. So we started doing what everyone else did and built a downloadable app that people could put on their own phone. And we then encouraged a smallish, very small group of farmers to go out and get Android phones. Um, and they came back with all sorts of rubbish, non-compliant phones. Um, and we had less a nightmare of getting any sort of a solution working on it. So that, that told us something very important. Um, and, and that stage, that was in Kenya. We discovered, did you get a phone like that? That's a cool pad that we were using initially. We were getting them a bit over $20 each, um, new out of China. And so it's not worth supporting, setting up an app and supporting it on someone's phone when you can just give them the whole phone. And what we discovered after that is that once we, once we started rolling out in Ethiopia and other locations where we had, you know, good support from World Food Program, we found that, you know, the farmers actually have an appetite for, like, once they realise the phone is useful, they, want, they actually wanted really good phones. And so the one we use at the moment, this is a fully waterproof military grade phone that's about, so it's the equivalent of an iPhone 7, really. And you get, you get them now for about, in bulk, you buy them for about $55 US. Um, which is a lot of money for an Ethiopian farmer, but like we now first pilot in Ethiopia, we, we didn't tell the farmers what the phones cost. We let them decide what they, we let them tell us what they thought the phone was worth. They all come up around $200. Um, and we gave them the option of much cheaper phones and, and these ones, and they, they pretty much gravitated towards the water, waterproof ones. Um, and they were very happy to, pay for the phone as long as they could pay it off over a couple of seasons. Um, they saw great value in that. And we had literally there's only one farmer in the, top, the pilot of 100 that didn't want to keep his phone and he was leaving the region. Um, the others, you'd literally have to pry it out of their hands um, to get the phone off them. It became the most valuable possession that they ever had. Um, and that's because as soon as we flipped the idea was we'll just give them the phone. It meant we could change other things so we could clean off the Android operating system. So interesting side fact that when you take your average phone out of China and you put on a clean version of Android, the battery suddenly lasts about twice as long. Um, so I don't know what the phones are doing normally, but it's not good. Um, and so we clean off the phone and we install the super app on it. So the phone boots up straight into Ag Unity. It still works like a normal, you know, you can still it's still a normal Android phone, but it's simple when they started up. And then we went with like a big, bold user interface because these most of our farmers have limited literacy. And so we gave them big icons in primary colors, geometric shapes. So, you know, press the blue triangle when you're handing over stuff. And we changed the way the interface worked. And this was really interesting. We went to a design workshop with World Food Program and they had the Google design experts in that, that wanted us to redesign the thing that, you know, the application that we've worked on for two years with the farmers. Um, and these were people that, you know, very well meaning, but they'd never been to a developing country. And they were like, you know, you've got to put all these things together. Whereas we'd very carefully crafted an interface that gives the farmers one thing to think about at one time. Like, what are you doing? I'm handing over a crop. What crop are you handing over? How much are you handing over? Who are you handing over to? So one step at a time, not the way we would sort of, um, I want an Uber from here to here and it's this type of Uber and I want to, you know, we, we're used to doing multiple things at a time. Whereas when someone has been introduced to technology for the first time, you need a very, very different simplified ap approach and you need to make things so that they don't rely on words. And also because we'd taken over the phone, we could do things like control the comms on it. So the other big challenge we have is most of these farmers uh, are in regions where they might have sketchy 
connectivity. Usually they'll know which hill to walk up to get a you know bar of signal or something like that. Um, but the bigger problem is they don't always have the money to pay for updating their data plan. So you need to be able to turn the phone into more of like a PC. So it, they can do transactions on it. They can transact with someone else. And we do that with QR codes. So I can say, I'm handing over a crop to you. I'll show the QR code on my phone. You'll scan it. And then we're creating a tra an encrypted transaction between us that works when there's no signal. And then when one of them gets a signal or it hotspots back, we send that transaction back to the cloud. So there's quite a few things like that that we evolved over the time by looking at what happens with the farmers and adapting that application. And so we had a very successful project in Kenya with wheat farmers, which was useful because growing up in a wheat farming area, um, it was a crop I knew a lot about. And on average, those farmers saw their income triple in from one season to the next, um, just by planting seeds properly, which they could do by sharing equipment, which they couldn't do before because the guy with the equipment wouldn't trust them to pay him back at the end of the season. And because they had a record, like we could essentially underwrite that guy, but once we did it once, he was fine thereafter. Um, and then when they came to harvest time, they were all harvesting at the same time. Um, so they could actually get equipment and could do it and take it straight to the mill and cut out middlemen and harvest in better quality. And so overall, really profound income increase. The second project we did in Papua New Guinea had similar results. Um, we That was with coca farmers. Um, if anyone's not familiar with coca, it comes in a big pod about that big and there's about 20 slimy beans. And the beans eventually turn into something like that. Um, but when you take them out of the pod, they they need to be fermented and turned over quite regularly. It's a, chocolate's got a lot more in common with cheese than people would believe. Um, it's a fermentation process that creates all the flavour. And so, so many of the farmers in Papua New Guinea would, you know, they'd want some money, so they'd go to their trees, they'd cut off some coca pods, they'd harvest it, they'd put it in some rice bags, and they'd leave them sitting beside the road. And they would hope a coca buyer came up to buy them. And quite often, either no one turns up, or if a guy does turn up, he says, you know, I'll give you a really low price or I'll pay you later. And invariably, that never works out for them. So they would have very little trust in that situation. And so by getting them together into a cooperative where every time they've got coca, they hand it into the cooperative, the cooperative ferments it and dries it, they're getting the dried price rather than the wet bean price. Um, we saw a really profound, you know, again, something like a three times income increase across a quite a large group of farmers. So we had two really good projects. We had these written up by a couple of major universities, including Oxford did a, a big study on us. So we got the um, endorsement that this really worked. It's a very, what AgUnity does is so simple. We're just giving the farmers a way of recording transactions. It's really nothing more than that. It's like the world's simplest accounting system. But because they've got that, something that we, you know, people in developed markets have probably had for 100 years and we take for granted, you know, we've had it for so long, we take for granted that good record keeping and the ability to get paid for something later is, it just happens, you know, in Australia and, and other developed markets. They don't have that luxury and they don't, so we've kind of lost track of how important that is just to keeping supply chains moving and, and farmers getting a price. And so that's, you know, that's what led to the great results. We got studied and then we, you know, won a lot of rewards, got some more, we got more investment we're able to grow the team and we're able to expand out into a lot more countries thereafter. Congratulations, it's really amazing. So, so I have a couple of questions. Um, mm -hmm. So let's start by the token. How does your token work? Because I think it's, this should be one of the tokens more promoted within the, the blockchain community, but it's probably not so much because sometimes people try to be more on that. But I, I know that a lot of people listen to us and actually I'm going to introduce it to a couple of communities that will love to be involved with you guys. Um, because of course there's, um, yeah, let, let's start by how the token works and then how, what kind of blockchain are we using? Because that's an important yeah, sure. thing as well. <laughs> okay, so firstly, we, um, the token's called Agriot, A-G-R-I-U-T. Um, we ride it, I think, I think I, I, we had our fifth year anniversary a few months ago and I dug up a presentation from about a week after we created Agunity that talked about the potential for a, for a token. So we've had the idea 
almost as long as Agunity, but we wanted to make sure that we had the farmer communities set up and established already. What's so important about the environment we're releasing Agria into is that the farmers already have the Agunity phones and they're already trading with a buyer or cooperative already. And so we have a bit of a, a circulation of flow, like the farmer will hand say their coca beans or coffee beans into a cooperative or a buyer. Usually they'll get some sort of payment or maybe not, or maybe they'll get paid later. So but this transaction between them and the cooperative or buyer is already happening. And then that cooperative is either paying a unity for the phones or for the subscription fees that we charge to the farmers. And so we have a bit of a cycle of phones, a bit, bit of a cycle of commerce going on already. So the aggregate token, its first use is just really simple. There's, there's a lot of more elaborate uses that we'll get into later, but the first one is really simple. You know, you buy a bag of coffee from your local supermarket. There's a QR code in the coffee. You scan the QR code and that releases some token directly to the farmer. And that's almost real time. It goes into actually the cooperative wallet because already the farmers have usually got like coca beans and local currency and maybe a solar kit they ordered in the cooperative. So they treat the cooperative a bit like a bank or a, a supplier to them. And they get some aggregate that's in the consolidated wallet. And then they can use that for say, paying off their phone or ordering a solar kit or getting seedlings from the, from the cooperative. And that's the real key. Like there's, there's all sorts of ways you can use a token in a developing market, but the trick is getting, you know, getting it to those last mile communities and then giving them a good way of using it. And then the next trick is the cooperative or buyer or whoever's accepting the tokens off the farmer needs to be able to get rid of them again. And we, Agunity buys them back because we have a very big problem. Like at the moment, we've got hundreds of farmers in Ethiopia that owe us for phones and we can't get the money out of Ethiopia. So we use, we collect it and we use it to pay our staff in Ethiopia, but that only works so long. <laughs> Um, so now we've got a mechanism that the cooperative receives the aggregate off the farmers, they sell it back to AgUnity, AgUnity sells it back to the consolidator entity we've set up, Aggregator, and that company sells it back to the coffee company and we've got a nice you know, flow of, uh, of supply there. In addition, and this is what surprised us totally, like when we were selling the first batches of aggregate, the biggest demand was people were going, oh, so I can just buy some aggregate and I can give it to a farmer and they'll receive 100% of it. I was like, yeah, sure. Um, so we've actually got a lot more people, like we haven't put it into the coffee bags yet. We've got people just buying aggregate because they're going, you know, if I denote to this other charity, I know they've got operational costs and I'm not sure how much it gets to the farmer and I'm not sure which farmer I'm giving it to. And we've already got, I think, 160 odd farmers. The, the website is um, agrewards.com. Um, we've got our Ethiopian farmers have been loaded onto that system. We've got about 160 of them loaded. There's only a few that we're still chasing photos for and stuff. And as of now, all of them have received at least about a dollar of rewards. And on average, they've had about $15, $17, which doesn't sound like a whole lot to us, but that's like half a month's income. Um, so that's a really um, positive thing for them. They're using the power phone. Some of them had $50, $70, which is really... Uh, important. So we've got a mechanism of just transferring money, of transferring something of value directly to a farmer. It relies on it coming into the AgUnity phone. They get the notice. Um, we've got some farmer testimonials already from farmers that are receiving that and using it. And then we've got, obviously, this is the first step. Get the, the, the aggregate going to the farmers, get them using it for buying seedlings and things from the cooperative. And now we've got Jerboss, our guy in Ethiopia, he's going out to the schools and the little shops and the other things that the farmers use and saying, well, okay, if you accept aggregate, we'll take it off you and you can use this as a local digital currency. So what we're trying to do is create it as a mechanism of, you know, sort of a barter system within their local community. And once that happens, we can add it onto a whole lot of other things. That's really impressive. And just for, for people that are not part of the community, how can they trade the token? What are the exchanges? Can you just tell us a bit about yeah, so uh, let's say if I want to buy the token, uh, how can I do it? Whatever I'm in the world. Yeah, so because one of the reasons we hold for so long is we were waiting to see how regulation lined up. Um, what is, you know, 
clarified the utility versus security token. Ag Agriate is, is very specifically a utility token. Um, we are coming from banking. Um, we know a lot about regulators and earlier this year, FATF put out their guide. F FATF, for anyone that doesn't know, is Financial Action Task Force. It's a non-elected body in Europe that advises regulators on what policy they should implement. Now, anyone in the bank is, knows that it's no secret that the regulators tell FATF what to write, and then FATF sends that back to the regulators so they can implement it. So everything we're seeing SEC doing at the moment is actually something that a year or two ago, SEC told FATF to write and FATF wrote it. And now SEC is more or less following what FATF guides. Um, so if you want to stay as a clear utility token, then the, and again, we hold ourselves to a higher standard than what other tokens might, might have done. Um, because we're using this token in developing communities, we can't, you know, we have a, an onus of responsibility on these farmers to make sure that this token isn't going to get hit by a regulator or banned in a particular country and all that sort of stuff. So other people can, can be a little bit more, um, a little bit less cautious in how they operate. So in order to make sure that we're comfortable around that, uh, that um, regulation that we believe is coming, um, we set up for three new entities. So firstly, this is the AFL aggregator, sorry, Agriate Foundation Limited, which is a limited by guarantee company in Australia, essentially a, a not-for-profit foundation. We're applying for DGR status on that. So it'll be a fully um, donor recipient charity, which is a bit unique in the crypto world. Um, and there might be a, a really interesting implication if, if that comes off the way we expect it to. Um, so that's the organization that owned the whole supply of the tokens and it releases those out into the market. Now it can't actually do any financial services because that would break um, arm's length. So we set up two other entities called Aggregator, one in Singapore, one in Georgia, which are two pretty crypto friendly uh, entities. And they act as like a travel consolidator. So they will sell the tokens out in bundles. A bundle seems to be that um, if anyone's familiar, there's three no action letters. This SEC have only ever issued three no action letters and two of them to gaming companies. Um, and selling tokens where it's a buy one, get one free seems to be um, acceptable, whereas any discounting model potentially makes you a security. So we're, we're releasing aggregate in bundles where you buy one, you get X free and each tranche, there'll be six tranches. Each tranche has a, a reducing number of get free when you when you sell the bundles. So the aggregator entity will sell those out until all those tranches are released, which will happen this year and next year. And then the tokens are sort of essentially out in the market and then they can establish their own price. So the aggregator entities at the moment sell the tokens. We also have a few um, crypto broker dealers that are handling it, well, one in Georgia, one in Australia, and we're, we're bringing on a couple more of those at the moment that do the KYC and the handling and the releasing of the tokens. The, the tokens themselves are built on the Celo network. Um, and for, for people that are not familiar with Celo, Celo is a mobile first, low bandwidth, like low, low cost of transaction, very fast transactions, and it's essentially ERC20 um, compatible. So it's a very, very similar to that. Um, but because of, you know, we're reasonable fans of Ethereum, but because of the high transaction cost and we do micro transactions, it doesn't really work well, well, so well for us. So we assessed quite a few blockchains and decided that Celo had those technical features as well as most of the other um, applications. A lot of the other applications and solutions built on Celo are designed for developing markets. So there's a lot of compatibility for the other things that have been built on Celo as well that we can interoperate with in the future. Well, that's really impressive. And I love that you guys have been very, very focused on making sure everything gets right and, and really impressive work. So, so let me go right now in terms of the present work you're doing, the vision for the present and future, because of course, putting all of this together is impressive. You guys have already a lot of solutions. So let's, let's look right now, where are you standing and what's your vision, let's say for the next one year, two years, five years? Yeah, so right now, um, the next couple of years, we need to 
get Agriot out into the market so it becomes a, a the the idea is to get it um, make it a community token so it's owned by the people that are holding on to supplies of it to reward farmers and the farmers and once it's in that market it can essentially establish its own value the foundation holds a little bit of a reserve of it to incentivize people coming in but really it oh sorry the, the other very important thing is one of the things you really can't do according to the FATF guidance is use a token offering to raise money for the company so ag unity isn't getting anything from the token sales of Agriot, um, because that potentially makes a security and the whole system was built and running before we created the token. Um, so at the point where we created Agriot, um, the systems already existed, the farmers already had the phones, you could already go and buy Agriot and set to a farmer so it already existed. So our big job at the moment is get that out and also scale the farmers. And that's another thing that Agriot helps AgUnity doing. So we've got say in Jima, Ethiopia, where we started our project, we have a cooperative with about 900 farmers and World Food Program sponsored us to start that project. They gave funding for the first 100 farmers to get phones. Those farmers, once they started paying it back, we extended that to about 200 farmers. And we've got another 700 that literally to every one of them wants to get an Ag Unity phone and then they want to be able to receive Agrid and they want to be able to use Agrid for other things. And so they are sort of in the queue to expand and we just haven't had the funding to get phones to all of them while the first few farmers are still paying back their phones. So these sort of two things happen in parallel as we release Agri to the community, more farmers get rewarded, they get to pay their phones quicker and more farmers get phones. So we're rolling it out in Ethiopia first, which is a huge country, massive coffee industry, the cooperative that we're dealing it in has half a million coffee farmers in it, the Ethiopian Cooperative Union. So we can expand Ethiopia to something in the order of half a million farmers. Um, the next project is in Papua New Guinea and we'll probably include Timor-Leste along with that. That'll be rolling out as of 1st of October. Uh, we'll have a, we are the Australian company that got into the Expo Live program as part of Expo 2020 in Dubai, which is Expo 2021 now, thanks to COVID. Um, and we'll have a kiosk right in the Good Place Pavilion, which is one of the main pavilions where people can scroll through all the uh, Papua New Guinea farmers, see the ones we've supported and give them some agriot. And then following that, we're hoping we can roll out in Indonesia, but we need to get agriot approved by the Indonesian authorities that had accepted token in their country. Um, so we'll, we've already got quite a big team in Indonesia and a couple of projects there. We just need to get the checked off. If not, we'll be rolling out in Kenya, Uganda as the third tranche. And then following that, um, it looks like Ghana and probably Colombia, but where it was sort of the last two tranches are still um, yet to be determined. So we've got a quite a big ambitious rollout. We should be reaching in the order of 60 to 80,000 farmers by the end of next year with the reach of this, but hope, certainly we hope we can break the 100,000, not too much after that. Very, very impressive. Uh, I'm really impressed with the, the scope of what you guys are doing. And really, uh, I didn't know much about it until now. So I'm really going to definitely open a lot of doors. So I want to go right now um, and we're passing one hour, but I have a lot of questions, but I'll try to summarize respecting your time. So two more questions at least related. So in, as you know, agriculture is probably one of the most sensitive areas because it relates with community, it relates with the herf. And relates as well with people, but as well with at the moment increasing with climate change, carbon neutral things. So, how do you look at that from that angle of your work? And especially eventually, are you using any kind of blockchain solution to check? For instance, I've been working with a company in agriculture that has been creating an AI tool that looks at uh, weather, climate changes, and things like that. So, are you looking at some of these things as experts as well? Because you are as well an agricultural tech company, besides using yeah. technology and blockchain. Well, there's actually something we did that goes right back to our hackathon roots is that when we started building the Ag Unity platform, like the second version, um, we decided that it needed to be a plug-in architecture. So we designed it so that other people can build the Ag Unity applets. So these, each of these icons is an applet in its own right. And we designed it so people could build those and then we could say, push that out to a thousand Ethiopian farmers tomorrow. 
and the, the whole point of that is like we're deploying the platform and the phone and it's already got the farmer's income in and it's got details. If the farmer wants to say apply for a micro loan for financial inclusion or you get some weather information, which is your AI or get connectivity to another service, all these features, there's so much effort to deploy them from the beginning and get, you know, give farmers an app, which they probably won't download or update. We can support all those things on a phone. So we're trying to design this as a platform that other people can you feedback on us and provide more services to farmers. The really big opportunity in all these advancing technologies. And, you know, one of my big worries about advancing technology in the world is that it mostly benefits the top fifth of the world, if that, whereas four fifths of the world get left behind. And that creates a serious problem. We see this with many of the farm management applications that are deployed. Like they're very good applications, but they're designed for just a slightly more advanced farmer. What happens is the slightly more far advanced farmer gets the farm application. He gets a, a good contract with a supplier and then he ends up buying from all the little farms around him at a much lower price than they were getting previously because the buyer prefers to buy from one well-organized farmer who's got the system. So what AgUnity is always trying to do is be the system that works for everybody. So the very smallest farmer isn't at a disadvantage compared to the slightly larger farmer. And that's what's so important with weather apps, trading apps, market price, um, and then also educate, you know, just education, you know, farm education, but also the kids education. The first thing that happens with our phones is it gets used for the kids to read educational videos. Um, so a phone is so much more than just a tool for farmers. It, it really becomes like, you know, their home entertainment system and their kids education and the way they get um, learn about what they should be doing in weeding, what pesticides they should we see some horrible behaviors around fertilizing and pesticides just because they don't know and it's so easy for them to ask a question now they've got the phone and for someone who's an expert in another country to say yeah you know don't don't be spraying glyphosate on this <laughs> you want to use something different so yeah there's there's so much that can be done around these things and it's a huge opportunity for ai to just answer the farmers questions because their needs are so simple and so easily resolved well, this is really impressive. Um, so I think one last question, and then I want you to give us where we can find more information. At, uh, we, of course, we'll put all the links within the interview and the, the promotion. But so in terms of um, the, so you mentioned technology, let's look right now at climate change and carbon neutral. So working for the last decade, because indirectly and directly, you've been always with agriculture, both from family and other things. What was the things that you discover more tricky in terms of, um, what is going on in terms of these areas of carbon neutral, uh, climate change and things like that? Because that's, I know that is a big thing right now. Well, I think it touches everyone, let's put it that way. Yeah, it does. Like this, there's, there's actually two things I'd like to cover on that. The firstly, firstly is one of the things we can do with Agriot, which is we're hoping to do in Timor-Leste, um, along with the, very shortly along with our New Guinea project is there's already a wonderful coffee company there that pays the farmers to grow trees for carbon credits. And we'd love to use, but the problem is that, you know, carbon credit takes a while before you actually get it. So the farmers have to grow trees for a number of years. They need to tag and monitor them. And that's a really big ask on a developing world farmer. But when we look at the economics of that, our farmers in Ethiopia honestly should stop growing coffee. They should just be growing trees for carbon credits. And you can imagine how much a better place the world would be if we, you know, people in Australia on average use about 18 tonnes of carbon a year at about $50 is the going rate of carbon. If we just paid farmers to grow carbon credits to offset our carbon use, they'd earn a great income, we'd be reforesting, reforesting land and the farmers would be earning a very, very good income just from reforesting desert. Um, and there's great, you know, there's great planting programs and irrigation systems that you can do that now. You can turn, you know, Sahal Devit back into forest if you've just got the land, the, the manpower on the ground. Totally doable, totally achievable. The challenge at the moment is what does a farmer in Ethiopia do with a carbon credit? The simpler way is, and this is again why we set up the aggregator entities, is they can be buying tokenized carbon credits or just other carbon credits 
um, paying the farmers in aggregate and acting as a broker middleman for exchanging carbon credits for aggregate. So we can pay the farmer all along, the farmer can get a regular monthly income while they're planting their trees and when there's a carbon credit to sell, we cash it out at the consolidator. So I'm really excited about that. That, however, goes back to something I saw at Standard Chartered working in market data then. I, I was responsible for getting data on some of the companies they were investing in and, and I saw a lot of companies that should not be getting loans. Like this was like a rerun of GF, you know, I'd been, a G, I'd been at Lehman Brothers for the GFC, so I'd sort of seen it. And s lots of banks in Asia Pacific, and I'm sure this is happening in Africa as well, were funding companies that were, there's a lot going into China for manufacturing companies that often didn't exist. And then there's a lot going into things like palm oil plantations. One of the horrendous things about that is if you're a big company in Indonesia, you could borrow money at couple of percent risk adjusted and you could buy up the land of smallholder farmers the reason palm oil is so popular is it's really cheap to manage you can plant 100 acres of palm oil and you need like one person to look after it so it's very low management it's relatively low income but it's enough to pay the loan on the the interest on the loan so palm oil effectively funds a real estate ponzi scheme and that's really what it is. If there's ever a drop in the price, there's a whole big reckoning coming that would be just like the GFC. Um, well, the very bad aspect of this is we know these small farmers that are getting the land buying up, they get like an unlucky season or an animal dies or something and they get into debt. They're often borrowing money at 30 to 50% if they can get a, nor a reasonable loan. If they're getting it from the nefarious side of things, that's often you know, connected with people that are human trafficking and things. So it's a loan that farmer's never gonna pay off. The suicide rates are high because they get stuck into these debt cycles. And then often the daughter goes into slavery to pay off the loan. And it's, it's not because they wanna do that, it's because literally that's been, the situation's been engineered upon them. And you've got this horrible disparity. You've got these big companies doing nothing productive with land, taking good productive mixed generative agriculture and turning into palm oil and they can borrow at a couple of percent and then you've got farmers who are borrowing at 50 percent per annum we're in a, a debt cycle they'd never get out of so that is a huge cause and by supporting these farmers you know one of the things we can potentially do with this system is just start lending those man farmers money at an interest rate that people in the developed market would love to get you know, my son's getting no money on his pocket money at the mo in the bank. If he could lend it to an African farmer who could keep them out of bad debt and get a couple of percent interest rate, he'd be super happy of that. So there's a lot more we can do as we extend aggregate into other um, opportunities like this. And I think it can play a huge role in addressing climate change. And as you pointed out before, there's like a billion and a half people and another billion supporting them. We, we make it to about three and a half billion of the farmers, their families and the people that are directly dependent on them that are in that agriculture, like impoverished agricultural community. That's a massive amount of resources that can do an awful lot for, for climate change if we in the developed market, we're just rewarding them for doing the right things. Even if it's not directly paying them for card of credit, just rewarding them if they're growing a mixed generative farm that's a little bit better for the environment. That's, that's really impressive. Um, so I, first of all, kudos and I'm really respect for what you guys are doing. Um, I still have a lot of questions, but probably one of the things I would like to do is do a second, uh, probably live event where we talk about financial inclusion and in, in the exchange because I'm going to create an event for that. But well, to wrap up and we passed the one hour, um, I still want two questions. Okay, I will go first one. The first one is bearing in mind that we have the app technology and we have blockchain. Are you creating like a, a digital community online, like a social network for your audience? Because you have quite substantial audiences and very easily you can get millions of users and you can create a lot of revenue streams. So that's the first question. Do you have something that in the pipeline? What's the, the area on that? Because uh, if not, I will help you for sure build that. But I just want to yeah, look, hear what so you that, guys are doing. Yeah. It's certainly, it's certainly on the roadmap. We haven't started to build it yet. And we've, we've been looking for a long time at the damage that things like Facebook and that cause in these communities. Like we were in Kenya during the previous election and we saw Facebook cause an 
an inordinate amount of damage in people's perspective, just misinformation being spread. So we realize there's a, a really high level of responsibility if you want to move into those areas. So what we're trying to do is set up the platform and then hopefully make applets that can do that in a very responsible manner. Um, there's also something else we did very early on about data privacy, because we come from the market data world, Bloomberg Reuters sort of things, their, their way of dealing with data is very different from say a Google or a Facebook where, you know, you use Google, Facebook, you essentially sign over all your rights to data. Whereas Bloomberg and Reuters are kind of like middlemen, right? They'll take exchange data or broker data and they'll pass it on to the customer and take a clip on the way. And we always felt that we would never own, we always held the Ag Unity would never own the farmer's data. We'll be a middleman, the farmers will encrypt their data, but they're the ones that ha should have the rights to it. And they're the ones that should benefit from that data in the future. So we've created a, a data structure that I believe is probably amongst the most ethical um, as a framework for that. So we, yeah, we'd love to partner with anyone that could implement a social network across what we're doing and ultimately, um, that could do a really lot of good in the world. Wonderful. So the last one is tell us where we can actually find information about you guys, how we can actually get engaged, how we can actually eventually fund some of these things, the best channels, the telegrams, the Twitters, the Facebooks, and as well the websites and the different things that you're doing in that direction. Because I think it's important as well to, to bring people over there. Yeah, look, so it's, it, it's quite easy. They all start with A. Um, so Ag Unity is the company. So Ag Unity builds the technology, and we're responsible for deploying it and supporting users. Agriot Foundation creates the token, and and they fund projects and and other good initiatives with the money they've raised from that and support the tokens. Um, and we've got an incredible chairman of that foundation, Paget Hargraves, who built the biggest indoor greenhouse in the world and is incredibly well connected. Um, we have an aggregator, which Keith Nielsen has moved across to run. An aggregator is the where you can buy and sell and exchange tokens. Um, and then we have the most important one, and the one I'd go to first is Ag Rewards. And Ag Rewards is the site where you can see our farmers in Ethiopia. And if you in two weeks' time, you'll be able to see another couple of hundred farmers in Papua New Guinea, and there'll be more added every time. You can buy some aggregate, and you can just give it to a farmer or buy some aggregate and sit on it for six months or a year or so. And then there'll be a lot more farmers and you can reward them. Um, at the moment, it's like pick a farmer and give them some aggregate up to a limit. There's, there's some problems if people give too much to one farmer and the others don't get it. So we've got a way of balancing it out. We're also adapting that system so people can say, you know, I've got a problem and I need to pay the school fees for my kids. Can someone help me out with that? So you'll actually have ways that you can specifically fund a particular thing and you know that it's going for that. You know that, you know, the farmer's not going to get it and go down to the pub, that it's actually going to go to their school or you can fund the cooperative that's helping the farmers get a new dryer or stuff. So we'll have a lot more bigger initiatives coming along this in a few months. So Ag Rewards is the one to really look for. Well, fantastic. So I think, well, thank you so much for your time. I, I definitely have a lot of ideas. I'll take it offline and help as well, you guys. And as well, um, as well, I think there's a lot of people we can involve because definitely this is about digital voice. There's a lot of things we can do. So David, uh, and the congratulations to you and to all your team. I know that it's not easy being there myself and as well being working in all of these things. I love as well the way you're putting this in a very ethical, but as well practical level. And as well, the way you've been doing. So uh, thank you for this time and for this, uh, this uh, interview. And uh, we'll be following up with more things. And our team will be as well putting a lot of other things to push this forward. Well, thank, thank you, you so much. very much, Dennis, for having us on the show. We greatly appreciate all the coverage because, yeah, it's really doing something good in the world. Thank you.